Chapter 13 Melissa True to his word, we spend the whole day Sunday wrapped up in each other. The times we manage to come up for air to refuel only end up with even more incredible sex and random spots around his house. I don't want the day to end. But with Monday morning coming quicker than I wish, I know I have to get home. Stay, he mumbled into my neck when I tried to leave the bed. I am sore in places I have never been sore before. It is the best feeling. Can't. I have to be in at seven o'clock. I am trying unsuccessfully to leave his warm cocoon of sex. Leave in the morning, he replies, while snaking his hand down my body and over my wet lips. Stay. Craig, really, I can't stay. I have to be up, and I actually have to get some sleep to get up. His fingers stop their movement, and within seconds, I'm on my back with his hard body over mine. Come back tomorrow. His blue eyes are searching mine, and there isn't anything but unspoken promise reflecting in them. Come on, beauty. His hips start rubbing against mine. With each thrust forward, the metal through his dick hits my clit and sends shocks through my body, electrifying my skin and burning my blood. If you won't stay, at least say goodbye, right? This man, it is glorious to knock him down a few notches on the ego scale. Watching his eyes spark when I give him a hard push off of me, then jump on top, is priceless. What did you have in mind? I ask, rubbing my swollen sex against his hard body. Did you want a good night kiss? Yeah, beauty. Give me a good night kiss, and I might let you leave. With a laugh that is too loud even to my ears, I slide my hands up his corded arms and pull his arms above his head. Don't move. Leaning up, I run my hands down his hard chest, leaving red lines where my nails pass over his heated skin. Not hard enough to hurt, but it's enough to make him feel the bite. Ready for your kiss? He's close to snapping, and I fucking love it. Without giving him any warning to my intentions, I crawl off his body. He raises one dark brow as I kneel close to his shoulder. Pucker up, babe, I say, and with a little twisting and maneuvering, bring my lips to his, and my mouth wraps tight around his throbbing dick. I lean up slightly when I feel his large hands grab my hips and pull me closer to his mouth, his fingers digging into my skin to make sure he doesn't lose his hold. You aren't following the rules, I joke. He gives me a sharp bite against my pussy, lifts his mouth off just enough to speak and grunts, Fuck the rules. God damn, you taste so fucking good. When he brings his lips back and clamps down, I moan like a whore and bring my lips back down to his cock. The rings throw me for a second, until I learn how to work them, and more importantly, how he likes me to work them. When I flick the ring through the tip, he moans. When I put my lips around both piercings and swirl my tongue, his whole body jerks and he growls against my clit. He almost flies off the bed when I take him deep in my throat and swallow around the tip. Fuck! He roars against my skin, turning his head and biting down against my thigh. The only thing he does is fuel my desire. I take him as deep as I can before slowly dragging my mouth back up. Melly! He trails off, and after a few seconds of feeling his abs clench against my tits, he brings his mouth to my wet center again and digs in. We continue to duel against each other for a good ten minutes, silently daring the other to come first. But when he takes one of the hands tightly gripping me and runs a finger lightly across my ass, I know I won't last long. He trails his finger from each end until he sinks it deep. With just a few deep stabs, I'm coming against his tongue. I pull my mouth free and scream loudly. You god shit, he laughs lightly against my pulsing core and before I can bring my mouth back down to a swollen length, he has me flying through the air and on my back in seconds. Can't go slow, babe. You have me strung too tight. Condom, Greg. Fuck, I want to feel you. I know what he means. I would love to feel him bare. You go make sure bitch face Barbie hasn't passed some nasty crotch rot off on you, and you're more than welcome to it. But not until you get checked. Firm on that, Greg. He grumbles his way to the drawer that has fallen to the floor at some point during the day, scattering condoms across the room, picks one up, 
and in no time is pushing hard back into me. Frantic would be a good word to describe how we come together, our skin slick with sweat, slapping together, nails biting into skin, and fingers digging deep, lips colliding and moans dancing together. It is magical. You sure you have to go? He asks me from his position sprawled naked on the bed. My eyes zone in on his naked skin, wishing I didn't have to leave but knowing I need to. I feel the connection, but I know we are moving way too fast. A little distance will be a good thing. Who knows, we might wake up in the morning and wonder what the hell has gotten into us. Doubtful, but it might happen. Yeah, I've got some things to take care of tonight, and then I have to go see Cohen tomorrow. Nephew, right? Oh my God, you're jealous of a kid? That's a good one. I burst out laughing when he looks away, clearly embarrassed by his jealousy. Come over Tuesday. We can do dinner or something. He throws back at me after a few moments of silence. Maybe. I smile over at him and zip the back of my dress. Nothing like stepping into the previous day's clothing. I'll call you. Melissa. Babe. That sounds like one hell of a brush off. He runs his hand through his hair and looks me in the eye. Don't play that hard-ass shit. You feel it. This connection we have isn't going anywhere. Fuck that. He pushes off the bed and stalks over to me. It's hard to remember my reasons for wanting to keep this just sex, just amazing, mind-blowing sex, when he is standing in front of me completely naked. I won't let you keep running when this feels so right. His voice rings out strong and firm. It's impossible to have a serious conversation with you when your dick is bobbing all over the place. Want to put some pants on? He just continues to burn his gaze all over my face, refusing to let my sorry attempt at changing the subject work. You scare me, I whisper. His eyes lose their hard, demanding look, and he immediately softens. Beauty, he murmurs back. Just give it a try. You don't get a connection like ours and just throw it away. Just try. It's moments like this, moments when all I want to do is be anyone other than the strong one, when I swear I can hear my sister speaking to me, yelling at me to live, yelling at me to stop letting her life and her mistakes pave the way for my happiness, the way to own my life and not let it be owned. Yeah, I can try. Tuesday, he asks again. Tuesday, I echo. I pull up at my apartment complex and sit in my car just taking in the lush ghetto-ness of my life. I hate living here. Having spent the last day in Greg's world, this is the last place that I want to be. I'm pretty sure there's a homeless man sleeping in the corner of my building, and I'm fairly positive that the apartment across from mine is running some massive drug warehouse. With a deep sigh, I drag myself out of the car and make my way up to my apartment. Passing the drunk unconscious man in the bushes and the neighbor's door that smells like a pot factory, I curse my financial status while throwing the door closed and locking all seven locks. I'm not paranoid, just smart. Not surprising, the message light is blinking. I'm shocked that my house phone wasn't ringing constantly all weekend. I realized too late Saturday that I'd left my cell at home. With a mother like mine, that isn't something you want to do. Having already lost Fia, she tends to go into crazy mode when she can't get a hold of me after too long. I toss my keys and purse down on the counter before pressing play and settling in for a good time. Melly Kate, where are you, baby? Cohen misses you. Call me, baby. My mother's voice echoes through the room, making me feel slightly guilty for not being home when she called. Melly Kate, where are you? Call me. Not even an hour later. Melly baby, please call me. You know I will worry. At least she waited until Saturday night for that one. Five more messages and the increasing unease that laces her tone has me reaching for the phone until the last one begins playing. Her words immediately stop me. Melissa, baby, they're at it again. I don't know where you are, but they sent another letter. Click. She doesn't need to say more because I know exactly who she is talking about, and I know exactly who they want. Fuck! I hiss, quickly picking up the phone and calling my mother. 
Baby, where have you been? She rushes out. Not even a full ring, and she has the phone in her hands. Jesus, Mom, I told you I had the wedding for my friend and wouldn't be around this weekend. I know, I know. I'm sorry, but you should keep your cell phone on you. She takes a deep breath and seems to hold it for hours before letting it out in a rush. They're at it again, Millie. What did the letter say this time? I question. Susan claims that with my old age and with you working too many hours to care for Cohen, that she should have sole custody. She claims that Sophia's will was incorrect, and that Simon wouldn't have ever agreed to that, regardless of the fact that his signature is on the contract. How can she argue that son of a bitch didn't agree with it, when Fia had all the proper paperwork drawn up? She wasn't stupid, Mom. She knew what would happen if Susan got her hands on him. I know. She isn't going to stop easily, Melissa. She wants him. I don't know why she is so determined, when best I can tell she didn't give two shakes about her own son. Probably why he ended up crazy and possessed. I can hear her starting to lose her patience. She won't get him, I promise. No way in hell I would snatch him up and run off to Mexico quicker than she can blink. Come over tomorrow. I need to see you. He needs to see you. I would feel better with my baby home with me. I laugh, but it holds no humor. All right, I'll tell Dr. Shannon that I can't stay late and come over for dinner. Love you to pieces, Millie Kate. Love you too, Mom. That night, nightmares of Fia's life, her insane mother-in-law, and shadows stealing my nephew haunt me until the light of dawn filters through my shades. My blissful weekend and the man that has wedged himself in my heart after such a short time are long forgotten. Chapter 14 Greg For the last two years I have watched one of the most important people in my life find herself and then find love. After that I started second-guessing everything that I thought I was okay with in life. A relationship was never something I wanted. I was happy to spend my time with bitches like Mandy. Well, that might be a stretch. I have definitely misjudged her. Big fucking time. Watching Izzy and Axel find each other again and overcome so much shit to be together makes me crave what they have. I want someone to lift me up, someone to go home to, and someone to have children with. I am ready, and for the first time in my life, I have a woman I feel might be worth making those changes for. I won't go so far as saying it was love at first sight, but it damn sure was hard on at first sight. That motherfucker doesn't have selective taste, though, so I can't rely on that alone. The first time she opened her mouth and started throwing her attitude is when I knew that she is worth it. She won't be easy. I know that she's hesitant to start something, and I am willing to bet it isn't because of someone burning her. When she told me about her sister, and I realized just whom she is connected to, I knew. I knew whatever issues she has are because of that motherfucker. Simon fucking Wagner. The reason I don't have Grace by my side anymore is the same fucking reason she doesn't have her sister. I am man enough to admit that it worries me about what will happen when she finds out about that connection. Monday morning comes way too fucking soon. I have spent the night hugging the pillow that still smells of my beauty like a little bitch. Every time the scent of vanilla hits my system, it is like a signal straight to my dick to salute the heavens. Every dream is about her, how her blue eyes spark with fire and lust, how they go wide and lost there when she comes, and how when she forgets to be scared, she gazes at me like she knows I hold all the answers. Yeah, I am officially hooked. A clear sign of my distraction is my missing Sway's presence when I pull up at core security. I am busy picturing Melissa bent over my kitchen counter, but when I look up and see Sway waving like an idiot, the hard-on I have been sporting all morning dies a quick death. What the fuck? Over the last few years that I have known this man, I have learned he is as unpredictable as they come. But the sight that meets me this morning is like nothing he has ever done before. There he is, standing on the sidewalk wearing those camouflage skin-tight pants things that chicks wear. The ones that make a man fall all over himself to follow her ass around the world. But on this man, they might scar me for life. If that isn't enough, the sparkling burgundy shirt hugging his round stomach might get a good laugh. Then I notice what he is doing. Sway, why are you painting the sidewalk? 
I questioned, looking down into the bucket of golden shining paint. Is that fucking glitter? Don't you start with all your alpha hotness, Gregory. Of course this is glitter. You can't paint the sidewalk gold without glitter. He's serious, bobbing his head left and right and waving his hands all over the place. This is for real? You're painting the sidewalk fucking gold? Does Axel know about this shit? Of course he does, my king of hotness. Don't be such a tight ass. Actually, never mind that, darling. Be a tight ass. Just let me see it. He starts laughing like a loon, and all I can do is look around and notice the explosion of fucking glitter. Sway, my man, you wouldn't know what to do with me. He sobers instantly, and I kick myself for encouraging him. Forget I said that. Tell me why you feel the need to throw glitter all over the damn place. Because, my hunk of fine, glitter makes everyone happy. When he starts dancing around his paint bucket, I have to leave. There is only so much sway that I can handle when he is acting like this. I might joke, but that man is the funniest little shit I have ever met. Right. You know who loves glitter? I question, noticing Coop's jeep pulling in. Coop loves glitter. Why don't you go give him a good morning that will make his day, Sway? I'll even hold your brush. Ooh, yes, right away, says sex a lot. He bends over, grabs a handful of glitter, and runs across the lot as fast as his heels will take him. I can see Coop's eyes widen when he takes in the man running full speed at him. At this point, I couldn't stop laughing if I try. The second Coop steps out of the jeep, Sway attacks, throwing glitter in the air and screaming, Good morning! When he leaps into Coop's arms, I fear I might hurt something, laughing as hard as I am. Good morning, asshole! I yell over at Coop and make my way inside. What the hell is going on out there? Beck asks, stepping up to the front window. When he sees Coop trying to untangle himself from Sway, he throws his head back and his laughter booms through the room, causing Emmy to jump in her seat behind the front desk. You are all so immature, I hear her mumble under her breath. Cheer up, Em. It's only Monday. Way too soon for that. When I see the look in her eye that clearly screams, Don't mess with me, I make quick work at heading to my office and a mental note to find out what is weighing on her mind. First thing I need to handle is calling that bastard Derek. Rounding my desk, I slam my body down and listen to the legs of my chair protest before picking up the phone and dialing a number that I won't forget. After all, when you call it daily for almost two years, you don't forget that shit easily. Johnson, he says in an impatient tone. Derek. My tone is lethal. This jerk-off knows I am not a man to cross. Cage, he sputters, clearing his throat and tries again. Cage, how can I help you? First thing you can do is tell me if you just conveniently forgot to mention that Simon and Sophia Wagner have a son. A son that is very much alive. Shit, he hisses, panic taking over his carefree fake bullshit. And by shit, I hope to fuck that means you must have misplaced your fucking brain and common sense? Do you not think that would be something? I don't know. The person signing your goddamn checks to investigate that bastard should know? My raised voice must have alerted Axel that shit is going down. Before I can even finish speaking, he is walking in, shutting the door and taking a seat across from me. Look, Cage, man, I didn't think it was a big deal. The kid was fine. It sucks about his parents, but he went to the chick's mom. It was all good. The growl that erupts from my throat is feral enough to scare any motherfucker. That kid has a name, asshole. You better fucking send me full case files. Today. I don't give a fucking shit if you have to rent a goddamn bike and pedal your ass over here. One hour. I want everything you didn't fucking share with me a year ago. Slamming the phone down should give me some satisfaction, but the rage boiling inside me just keeps heating up. You want to talk about it? Axel questions. You want to tell me why the hell you're here when you should be at home with your bride? Changing the subject seems wise with the amount of anger I'm dealing with. You try staying at home when you are attacked every two seconds. That woman is insatiable. Never thought I would need a break, but my dick is tired, man. Jesus Christ, jackass, can you not talk about that shit with me? You asked, he laughed. The fuck I did. I asked why you're here, not why your dick isn't working. 
Right. Enough about my wife. Want to tell me now what that was all about? All the humor leaves his face. I can tell he is worried. You know Izzy's friend, the nurse at Nate's doctor's place? Yeah? What about her? He questions, looking at me as if I did something wrong. Jesus, tell me you haven't made her your new plaything. Do not fucking call her a plaything, I growl at him. His eyes narrow at my tone, and I would laugh if I weren't still heated over the plaything comment. Okay, you want to explain that shit? I've never seen you two seconds from pissing all over the place to mark your territory. He lets out a laugh and holds his hands up. Do I really want to get into this with Axel? Sure, out of the five of us, he would be the one with the experience to tell me what I need to do. But having him know what a whipped bitch I am over one chick I just met is something different. Nothing to tell yet. And yet means you took her home with you after the wedding. Let me guess. Spent the weekend together. Decided you want to run off into the fucking sunset and have little dogs that yap at the mailman. Maybe if you're lucky, find a bowling league that meets every Friday. What the fuck, man? This timid shit isn't like you. Fuck you, asshole. I chunk an unopened pack of computer paper and laugh when it knocks him in the head. You deserved that. What the fuck ever? Izzy is going to have your ass for messing with my perfection. He throws the package back on the desk and gives me one of his silent, you better start talking looks. Jesus Christ, he's about to go all Dr. Phil. What's going on, G? You've been around but silent ever since Nate was born. I know something happened with that motherfucker your sister was married to, but you never wanted to talk. So, now you're going to. Would you like me to go put my fucking vagina on for this talk? Sarcasm is dripping from my words. I need to hash this out, but fuck, this is awkward. Not many people know the details on Grace. Well, I should say the after Grace. Axel told me over and over to let it go. To live the life Grace would want for me. But I can't. I need to see Simon brought to justice. He didn't get the justice I would have chosen. But I'm not crying into my milk and cookies that he is rotting in hell, either. No need to be an asshole, Greg. Just want to know how I can help. He leans back in the chair, and I can tell he means it. Axel would catch hell from Izzy for not helping me. But more importantly, he is family. And family helps family. With a deep breath, I let the story out. Her sister was married to Simon. Didn't know for sure until this morning, but after that call to Derek, I sure do. The worst part, I don't know how she'll handle it when I tell her I could have stopped him, but I didn't. I rest my head forward on my hands and let out a heavy sigh. I could have stopped him, and she wouldn't have lost her sister. Holding that shit heavy, Axe. After a long period of silence, he speaks, and I can tell by his tone that what I just put out there shocks him. I don't even know what is the most fucked up part of all that. The fact that there is this messed up connection between the two of you, or that you actually blame yourself for that shit that happened. You know just as well as I do that there wasn't anything you could have done to that bastard. You didn't have any proof, Greg. Nothing. You can't keep blaming yourself for something that you couldn't control. The hell I couldn't. I could have taken his ass out a long time ago, and you know it. And what? Spent the next lifetime locked up? You know Grace wouldn't have wanted that life for you, Greg. You know she would want you to be happy. His eyes have that look that he used to give Izzy when she would go back into herself. The look she got when she remembered that I almost died to save her. The same thing I should have been able to do for Grace and Sophia. I hate being on the receiving end of that look. How am I supposed to tell her that I not only know who her nephew's father is, but that I tried and failed to find something to put him away before he fucked up another woman? Frustration doesn't even come close to how I feel right now. I know that what I've found with Melissa is worth exploring, and I will be damned if I let Simon fuck with that from the grave. Don't tell her right away, man. You just met. And if you are serious about her in this relationship, you need to find out if it's worth it. Because you know that no matter how you lay that out there, she isn't going to take it well. She needs to know you first. But don't let this sit too long, Greg. It'll be worse, and it might not be fixable. I hear you. 
but I don't like the idea of starting something new on a foundation that isn't solid. I lean back in my chair and look him in the eye. I feel it, Axe. That connection that you can't ignore. And I want it. His eyes widen slightly, but before he can speak we hear a commotion coming from the front. What the hell happened to you? We hear a bellow from the front of the office, followed by Coop's cackles down the hall. Shut up! Maddox's lethal tone cuts him silent. The sight that greets Axel and me when we reach the lobby is one that has me struggling with my own laughter. There stands Maddox Locke, all six foot four inches of pissed off and rumpled man. The best part is the gold paint and glitter that covers every inch of his body, from his hair to his boots. You look ridiculous, I laugh, unable to control it. Did you tell Mr. Happiness next door to make a golden brick road out there? He starts walking over to me, and I notice his slight limp, which sobers my humor instantly. You okay? He doesn't miss my question, but ignores me and stalks off to the back of the office. Looking over at Axel, he catches my concern and takes off to make sure everything is okay with Maddox. It might be funny, but in all seriousness, we all worry about him. Looking over at Coop to make sure he is keeping his shit in check, I find him following Axel into the back. Em, babe, where's Beck? She looks up, and I can't help but notice the pain in her eyes. Em, what's going on? Nothing, Greg, I'm fine. Beck left about five minutes before Maddox got here. He was going to check on some cases, she says. She clears her throat, and her eyes are begging me to stop, pleading with me to not ask any more questions. Emmy, you know my history, and you know I am here for you. So please tell me what has taken your smile. The guys take great pleasure in making fun of how much I father these girls. But when it comes down to it, I can't stomach the thought that someone is hurting them. I made a vow to myself a few years after I lost Grace, after too many years of careless and reckless abandon, that I would never let anything happen to another woman in my life. It really is nothing, okay? She sighs. Let's just say it was made painfully clear that I will never be what he wants. She doesn't need to say more for me to know that the he is the one and only Maddox Locke. Poor girl has had it bad for him for too long. Emmy, you do know it isn't anything about you, right? I round the desk and kneel in front of her, spinning the chair so that I can look her in the eye. Sometimes there is nothing you can do, no matter how pure your heart is, to clear the darkness from someone's past. He's got some shit that would even dim your light, babe. Leave it and just be there for him if he asks, yeah? It doesn't sit well with me that this sweet and innocent woman has her sights set on Maddox, the one we have dubbed the Dark One for years. I understand, Greg. It's just not easy. Watching the single tear fall from her golden eye is a killer. Slowly over the months, she has gone from smiling freely and shyly to being as stoic as Maddox. Nothing worth having ever is, babe. When my own words smack me in the face, I realize that to make things happen with Melissa, I'm going to need to eat those words. Chapter 15 Greg Once things settle at the office, it is a lot easier to go about my business. My fire at Derek hasn't dimmed one bit, but I know I need to keep my head straight here. Not even thirty minutes after my call, Derek comes running into the building with a box full of case files. I'm pretty sure the idiot pissed his pants when he walked in my office and found not only one pissed-off person, but two more. Coop and Axel have no issues with sitting in here and throwing their vibes at the idiot. It takes me a good hour to look over the case files and realize that I have messed up, and messed up big, in trusting him. Not only is he lacking on the information he has relayed to me, but he has also failed to mention just how bad things had been in the Wagner house. I find five trips to the hospital, not including the birth of the son I never knew about, fourteen visits from the local police from calls the neighbors had placed that only ended with Sophia Wagner telling them everything was a-fucking-okay. And the cherry on the top is the final call from Derek that fails to mention the sleeping son found just upstairs from his dead parents. Fuck, I grind out, slamming the latest file of fucked-up bullshit down on my desk. Do you believe this shit? I ask Maddox. 
Since I started to pore over the files, he is the only one left in the building stupid enough to put up with my shit. How could I have been so fucking blind to this shit? I am the one who asked this idiot to investigate, to let me know everything, and I get half-truths and watered-down bullshit. Got played. Can't blame yourself for the movie, mate. You had enough shit on your hands with Izzy, Axel, and that motherfucking Brandon. He finishes up looking at the last file I threw at him and leans back in the chair, absent-mindedly rubbing his left knee. You all right? I ask, nodding my head towards his knee. Fine, shut up about it. I'll be picking glitter out of my brain for years. I can tell there is more there, but I know better than to push him on it. I'm here if you want to talk. And stop being a son of a bitch, yeah? I'll stay out of your shit, but stop. And you know damn well who I'm talking about here. Now, back to this mess. What do I do with all of this? Keep it close until you know more about this chick. No need to open old wounds unless you know it's worth being the rock she's going to need. He stands up and makes his way over to the door. When he turns around and I meet his black eyes, for the first time in years I see some compassion in them. For what it's worth, you deserve some peace, brother. She could be the rock you need, too. And with that, he's gone. I stay in the office for a few more hours catching up on some cases that need some work done. Checking in with the ones that need my attention and just avoiding thinking about Melissa for a few seconds. Not easy, when all I can remember is the weekend I spent with her. All it takes is one second of her face filtering through my mind for my pants to tighten up. To say I've got it bad would be like saying the sun is a small star. Deciding that I could care less what it says about me to be calling this soon, I pick up my phone and hit her name. After a few rings, I hear her breathless voice, and my heart picks up speed instantly. Hello? Melissa. God, her voice is just enough to wipe all the shit from the day away. Greg. I might be imagining things, but I'm pretty sure she just sighed my name. And that's enough for my ego to blow up. Yeah, she might play a mean game of keep away, but she isn't as unaffected as she initially wanted me to believe. Been a long day, babe. And it's only lunch. Run away with me and let's go grab some. That would be nicer than my current plans. I can't get away today, Greg. And I'm not sure about tomorrow. If it wasn't for the regret in her voice, I might feel like she was giving me the brush off. What's going on, Melissa? Nothing you need to worry about. Just some family issues. I know it's early and my trust hasn't been earned yet, but that shit still stings a little. I can't help it. It's who I am, and I want to fix things for her. You do know you can talk to me. I get you don't want me in your business until you know me better, but if you need to talk, don't shut me out. There's a long silence, and I can almost hear the wheels turning over the line. I know. I just need to deal with this, okay? I might not like it, but for now, I can give her that. Yeah, beauty, for now. You're so frustrating, Greg Cage. At least the laughter and lightness I left her with has returned. I want to see you soon, and I won't take no for an answer. Finish your family business, but call me tomorrow. I don't hear from you tomorrow, then I will come to you. Lunch, dinner, or fucking brunch. Okay, okay. I'll call you tomorrow and let you know what's going on. Does that work for you? Smartass temptress. The next day isn't much better on my sanity. Walking into work on a golden sidewalk is almost comical enough that I might have started the day positively. But entering the office to find Emmy in tears, Coop frustrated with his not knowing shit about women or how to fix them, Beck worrying and consoling Emmy, and Maddox punching holes in his office doesn't bode for a good beginning. I feel torn between my need to protect Emmy and her innocent, pure love for a man who can't accept it, and a man who has been a brother to me for many years. I know the background, and I know that it isn't going to get better any time soon. With Axel finally gone for the week, all the heavy shit falls straight on my shoulders. The best anyone can get out of Emmy is that she is okay. She calms down when I pull her aside and remind her of our previous conversation. I get her. I really do. Some of us are put on this earth to heal, to make others' lives brighter. And when those people don't want our help... Our love? We feel it deep. 
No matter what I say, that isn't going to change with her, but this discord in the office needs to fucking stop. After that, it seems like fire after fire. We have cases with issues, computers crashing, and Maddox still banging shit around in his office. If I know I am going to see Melissa today, I can almost take this shit. But already knowing that isn't going to be happening is just increasing my foul mood. By mid-afternoon, I can't take it anymore and finally call her. I get her voicemail and leave a quick message to call. Her return text is short and to the point. Can't do today. Too much family stuff. And has my gut rolling. No reason, but my gut never lets me down. Something is going on and I can't help her without knowing what is happening. This feeling of not helping is new to me. For the last almost five years, I have been the rock. The go-to. The strength to help. And it almost makes me feel like I am doing something that would make Grace proud of me. Something better than all those years that I spent wasting away, living off booze and whores on the road. I want to be that person for Melissa. And it is killing me that she won't let me in. My mind keeps telling me to be patient. It's new, and who trusts someone that much after a week? But my heart, fuck me, my heart is telling me to drive over to her now and demand she let me in. Crazy, I know this, but when you know, you know. She is a woman worth the trouble, and if my gut is right, she could be the one to heal the wounds I have been carrying around for far too long. When my phone rings right before closing time and I see Melissa's name across the screen, my heart leaps. Like a little bitch, it leaps right into my throat. One week and I am already this deep. Shit. Miss me? Expecting to get some kind of sass back, or at the very least a hello. The soft sob that catches over the line has my heart dropping right back down. Melissa, what is it? Grabbing my keys without even knowing where I am needed is a knee-jerk reaction. I am out the door with a few jerks of my chin to the others and leaving the lot. Baby, where are you? She takes a few minutes to control herself, and when she speaks, the tone isn't sadness. It's pure fury. I will kill that little tramp, Greg. My car might be shit to someone, but it is mine, and it is important to me. Sure, it's a piece of shit, but it is my piece of shit. At this point, I have to pull over. Despite the driving need to reach her and fix whatever the hell just went down, I can't for the life of me figure out what the hell she is talking about. Babe, I'm trying to figure out what exactly you're talking about here, so can you give me some more details? I lean forward and try to rub some of the stress out of my neck. Okay, let me spell this out in a way you might get. Your little stalker? I'm thinking maybe you weren't clear enough with her when you ended things. I would like to think I know you well enough that you wouldn't be messing with me and trying this hard to get me to open up. So imagine my shock when she shows up at my job throwing her shit. Jesus Christ. Tell me you're kidding right now, Melissa. Do you think I would be calling you right now to come get this trash if I wasn't serious? Her screams through the line almost caused me to drop the phone. Where are you? At the office, you know, my job, where there are children and families and all these happy family vibes. Yeah, those vibes just blew the fuck up when Stalker Sue came into my work, screaming about how much of a whore I am for breaking up her relationship. Then, when we finally get her out of the office and I have some time to calm down, I walk outside and find her slicing my tires with a goddamn knife. So, being that I can't drive with four flat tires... I am still at work. How did I not see this coming? Well, maybe not this, but damn Mandy and her fucked up shit. Call the police, baby. I'll be there in 15. And Melissa. What? She spits out. Might not be the best time to mention this, but all this fire and attitude you're throwing at me? Baby, you got me so worked up that it will be a miracle not to take you the second I lock eyes with yours. You're a beast, Greg Cage. Might have been inappropriate, but when I hear her laughter before disconnecting, I know I did something right today. Chapter 16 Melissa No need in denying it. Since leaving Greg's house Sunday night, I have been on cloud nine. Not even the crap Cohen's paternal grandmother is throwing her away is messing with my high. I am stressed, but only because my mother is making me that way. 
Susan has started with her letters again, and has followed those quickly with her calls. And then we get to experience the pleasure of her knocking my mother's door down around three this morning. A little history of Susan Wagner is helpful. Susan Wagner is a pill-poppin', body-usin', drunk, white trash bitch. She has enough DUIs that she is no longer allowed to drive, but that doesn't stop her. I'm sure at this point that even she has a few venereal diseases. And when she throws her creepy-as-hell wicked witch grin out, all that you see is gums. The only thing Simon Wagner did right in his life was to make sure that Cohen would go to my mother if anything ever happened to them. As fucked up as he was, she is a million times worse. So not only is my much-needed sleep interrupted by a frantic call and having to drag myself over to my mother's house to deal with Susan in her drunken rage, but now I have to deal with another crayon not bright enough for the box. When I find myself pulled, literally pulled, out of the exam room by a furious Dr. Shannon, the last thing I expect to find is a chick that has become my shadow ever since Greg has started showing interest in me. Except this time, she has lost all of her carefully crafted perfection. She looks unkempt. That perfectly put-together look I have seen every other time is gone. Poof, and in its place is a complete stranger. She reminds me of one of those stray dogs you see in city alleyways, the ones that have fought over the last scrap of meat for so long that they don't even know a crumb from a pebble. Apparently, Greg is a piece of meat in this equation. You fucking bitch! She screams at the top of her lungs in a waiting room full of patients. Not just patients, but also parents and children of all ages. With her burst of crazy, the small children start getting scared, the older ones get curious, and the parents get pissed. I can already tell that this isn't going to end well. I lose track of the things she spews across the waiting room. I catch bitch a few more times. Homewrecker, which throws me for a loop. But whore is the one that made me snap. I do what I have to do, and that is round the desk, grab her by her bony arm, and lead her to the door. Not a single word passes from my lips, but at this point I am boiling with anger, and I know the second my lips part, I will enter crazy town with her. I open the lobby door and push her out as hard as I can, taking great pleasure in watching her wobble on her heels before falling flat on her ass. She opens her mouth to start another attack of her verbal vomit, but with deadly calm, I force out a firm don't and close the door. I make the walk of shame past the patients and apologize profusely for the incident. The kids seem to have already forgotten the madwoman and quickly turn their attention back to the Disney movie playing, but the parents look at me with an expression that can't be described as anything other than hate. When I enter the back office, Dr. Shannon is waiting. I get a box thrust into my arms and a, get out, you're fired, before he turns on his old as dirt legs and walks away. You can't fire me for someone else's actions. This is ridiculous, I call after him. That's where you are wrong, Melissa. You brought that disturbance into my office and caused a nice big scene that I now have to clean up. Pack your locker up. We will mail your last check. It takes me a few minutes to really understand that I just lost not only my job, but also the only source of income keeping my mother, my nephew, and my own head above the turbulent waters. I am fucked. I can't even let myself dwell on all the ways of screwed I am right now, because that bitch is going down. I make quick work of cleaning out my locker, grabbing my stuff, and telling Brenda, the manager, that I will call her to discuss Dr. Shannon's behavior. She feels terrible but we both know it would be pointless to continue to fight with him. When I push through the lobby doors into the parking lot and see Mandy frantically stabbing my tires with a knife, I lose it. In hindsight, it might not have been the smartest move to charge a woman with a large knife, but fucking hell, I am done with this. You crazy little shit, I yell, watching her eyes go all wonky. Throwing my box on the ground, I make quick work of the distance between us, bend at the waist, and knock her ass to the ground. My mind doesn't register the sharp pain in my arm long enough for me to even give it a thought. Taking her hand with a knife, I slam it into the ground and watch her eyes widen and water with the pain. She lets her grip slacken, and I quickly throw the knife away with my other hand. You stupid, pathetic little shit! Not sure what you think you had with Greg, but he is done. You want me to think you're someone special to him, but, sweetheart, you forget that he has already made it clear he is done with you. He is mine! she growls. You will never have him! Oh, that is where you're wrong. I already have him. I smile sweetly at her, but when her face contorts into what I can only describe as whacked to the highest power, I know she's past seeing reason. Really? Well, he was in my bed last night, 
and every night before that. He might have fun with you, but he always comes home to me. You're insane. I move to get off her, and then she pounces, grabbing a hold of my hair and slamming me down to the ground. My head knocks on the asphalt for a second, but not long enough to keep me from shaking it off and springing back. Not even concerned with the hold she has on my hair, I rear back and slam my fist into her gut. Her grip loosens instantly. I follow that with one more to her temple and watch her eyes go hazy before she falls to the ground. Oh my God, Melissa! Melissa, are you okay, sweetie? I turn around and watch Brenda running out of the office door with the phone pressed to her ear. I called the police, saw the whole thing. Oh my God! Oh my God! I'm okay, Brenda. Promise. Give me a minute, okay? I walk over and place the one call that to me is more important than calling the police right now. Greg. Not only is this his mess, but I can't deny I would feel better with him here. After the quick call to him that has my blood pressure jumping again, I hang up and can't hold back the smile that ticks over my face. Yeah, I want him here. And not because of the mess, which arguably is his fault. But I want him here because he makes me happy. And for the first time in a long time, I am embracing that happiness without the fear that something will take it away from me. The police came and took Brenda's statements and mine. Since Barbie is still passed out in front of my car, they called the ambulance to take her to the hospital. Luckily, the parking lot is monitored, so they tell me they will collect the security footage and get back to me if they have any further questions. Brenda is shocked when I tell them I'm not pressing charges. That is my own deal, and I'm not changing my mind. She wants to start more shit? Let her. I'll be waiting next time. Unlucky for me, Greg shows up and the paramedic is cleaning the graze on my arm from my run-in with a knife. Nothing bad, but there's enough blood covering my arm and scrub top that he takes one look at me and goes solid. I'm talking you can feel his fury hit hard. He makes it to me in two large steps, takes in my face, and his eyes roam every inch of my body making sure there isn't anything he is missing. You didn't tell me she hurt you. You didn't tell me that she attacked you. He didn't seem mad at me, but still, I decide it would be best to lead with caution here. I think that it might be a correct assessment of the situation if you were to say that I technically attacked her. His eyes that have been looking at the white bandage against my skin shoot up to mine, and I can't miss the humor that flashes briefly before concern takes over again. I'm sorry, he questions. Well, one thing you might want to know about me is that I won't lay down and let someone fuck my life. She was messing with my car and, in turn, fucking me. This happened ten minutes after she got me fired from my job and threw so much garbage around the office that I doubt I will find work for years. So, yes, it's safe to say I attacked her. Okay. Not sure I know what to do with that, but we can come back to that later. Are you okay? Greg, I'm fine. I just caught the knife for a second, but it's nothing but a flesh wound. I smile at his handsome face and try to ease some of the anger I can still feel coming off of him in waves. If it makes you feel better, she looks a lot worse. He holds my eyes for a few minutes before he lets out a deep laugh. Not wild about seeing you hurt, beauty. Are you done here? What do you say we head back to my place and you can fill me in on the rest of the stuff you just said? Yeah? Yeah, Greg. That sounds good. Brenda hands me my box that until that moment I'd completely forgotten about. And after we wait for the tow truck to take my junker away, we head off to his house. On the way over, I make a call to my mom, letting her know that I had some car trouble and I would be over tomorrow. I know my problems will still be waiting for me in the morning, but right now, I need this. I need Greg. Shockingly, the thought of needing someone else doesn't terrify me. Chapter 17 Greg after her quick call, she puts her phone away and is asleep in seconds. It isn't long after that when her head hits my shoulder and her arms curl around my arm. Hell, she can pull the damn limb off if it makes her feel better. When I pulled up at the pediatrician's office and saw her sitting on the curb bleeding, I almost lost my damn mind. I'm no stranger to the feeling of overwhelming protectiveness, but I have never felt it this powerfully. Never has every inch of my body turned to stone-cold fury in seconds. There is no doubt in my mind after that, she is mine. And judging by how quickly her body turns to mine in her sleep, she knows this too. Her mind just hasn't caught up with her heart and body. I wave at Stan as we drive through the gate. 
Taking a long ride through the neighborhood gives me a few extra minutes with her resting against my body. It gives me time to enjoy her unguarded trust a little longer. When we pull up at my house, she still doesn't stir. I turn off the truck and unfold my body before making my way to her side. I stand there for a few minutes, just taking her all in. Running my fingers lightly across the bandage on her arm brings it all home, and the vice on my heart gives a tight squeeze. I caused this. Maybe not directly, but in my mind, it's the same thing, and it is killing me. Beauty, I murmur, stroking her hair lightly. Her eyes flutter a few times before meeting mine. Come on, let's get inside and lay down. It's early, not even close to dinner time, but if laying down makes her feel better, safer, then that's fine with me. I'm okay, just needed a little power snooze. Her voice is husky with sleep, causing me to fight with myself to keep my lust at bay. All right, well, let's get settled and you can fill me in on the details, yeah? Sure thing, baby. I know she just woke up and most likely doesn't even realize she said that, but that word goes straight to my heart. Zaps right through and causes it to fill with so much elation. I should be worried. After all, the woman has the power to level my world. We make our way inside and settle. Sitting down on the couch, I don't even give her time to consider sitting somewhere else in the room. I grab her hand and pull her onto my lap. My arms enclose around her and I let out a low, relieved breath. Fill me in, babe. She looks into my eyes for a few minutes. For what, I'm not sure, but she must have found it because she begins her story. Not easy to hear, but damn, I'm proud of her for sticking up for herself. When she stops talking, I can't even speak. I have to keep myself still to control the fury and the need to do something. You didn't press charges? Please tell me, Melissa, that I heard you wrong there. She looks up into my eyes, slightly confused at my tone. Not angry with you, baby, just trying to figure out why you wouldn't press charges against her. I just want her gone. I don't know her, and I know you and her had your thing, but this is a little too much. The hand that has been lightly stroking her thigh stills. And you're going to let this shit come between us? I didn't say that. What I said was it's too much. I lost my job because of her, Greg. My job and my family's income all gone because of your fuck buddy. Baby, I get that this is some heavy shit, but you need to understand that I wasn't a saint before I met you. I wasn't perfect, not even close, but that shit with Mandy ended when we started. Not that there was much to end, but I made it clear to her at the wedding that we were finished. I made it clear again when she showed up at the gate throwing more shit. I don't know what's going on in her mind, but I'll find out. I don't want you to worry about her. I believe you, I do. But that doesn't change the fact that I lost a lot more today than just some skin on my arm. I flinch at the reminder of just how dangerous this situation was today. Let me take care of it, baby. How are you going to take care of this? Her brow furrows, and confusion mixed with disbelief flashes in her eyes. First, you're going to let me deal with Mandy, but I still want a restraining order on her. Second, I know some people around town. I just did a security install for a general practitioner's office right down the street. Just let me call and see if he's hiring. Third, let me in. Just let me in, beauty. The silence around us while she takes in my words is heavy. She doesn't want to let me in. I know this. But that doesn't mean that I will stop until she at least lets me have the chance to prove to her I deserve it. Mally, baby, I sigh. Trust me when I tell you that I have lived a life that makes me know when something is worth fighting for. I took one look at you and knew you were worth it to me. It's new, I get that, but I know you feel it too. I feel it, she whispers. I feel it, and it terrifies me. Why? What has you scared, baby? Tell me, so I can help. You don't understand. When I lost Fia, something inside me changed. I have always been the guarded one in the family. Mom is amazing, but she is weak. Fia was the same way. They let men walk all over them, and I always said I wouldn't be like that. I wouldn't need a man. My dad piece of shit. What I do remember isn't pretty, and I watched my sister relive that nightmare with no hopes of helping her. 
For years I have had fun, but never let a man in. Greg, you have the power to not only get in, but to destroy me if you ever want back out. I can't make you promises, Beauty. I can't sit here and tell you that I'm worth letting those walls down for. But I can tell you that if the way I feel for you now keeps growing, there isn't an army strong enough to pull me out. Spent too long wanting someone worth it, and as crazy as it sounds, one look, baby, it took one look that even being covered in Nate's vomit couldn't dim how bright that beauty knocked me down. She laughs softly, but still looks at me as if she is worried I might vanish with her next breath. I want to be there. There's just so much going on. Now this, us, and everything else that's flying around out of control. I don't know how to just let go. Let me in, I stress again. I... I don't know how. It's like watching a caged animal try to escape. I can tell she wants to. She wants to let me in so bad, but she really doesn't know how. You don't have to be strong all the time. Let me take it, beauty. Let me be your rock. Let me fight. For Christ's sake, let me be who you need. Each word out of my mouth has her eyes widening. Hell, I don't even know where that all came from, but I need her to understand. I need her to get on the same page as I am before I am the one losing myself in someone who doesn't want me. My mom has custody of Cohen, Fia's son, but that is only because with all the hours I work, it isn't possible for me to have him. I spend as much time as I can with him, but that still isn't enough. Mom's old, but can still get around. She doesn't work because, well, she's old. And even though she can get around, that doesn't mean she does it without difficulties. My check pays for everything, which is why I live in a shithole apartment in the middle of the hood. Cohen and his well-being get it all. Do not think that is a complaint. I would give everything for that kid. She pauses and looks into my eyes for a few seconds before looking back at my hand resting on her leg. I give her a light squeeze and she continues. Simon, Fia's ex, was a real douche. Already told you about him, but even though he is gone... I still feel like he is fucking with my family. His mom, Susan, has been coming around for the last year trying to get Cohen. She tried to go the legal route, but there was no judge in the world that would give her custody or even visiting rights. Bad. The worst kind of human being. I am well informed about Susan Wagner, but I'm not letting her know about that right now. She is just letting me in, starting to let her walls down and trust me. No way am I messing with that right now. So, anyway, she's been causing some drama, calling, sending letters, and coming around. She's harmless but annoying, and it scares Cohen. That is what I've been dealing with since Sunday, trying to keep my mom calm and Cohen clueless. You think she will be trouble? I question. No, I mean, yes, for now, but I think she just misses her son, or I should say the idea of her son. She doesn't want Cohen, she just doesn't want us to have him. Seems reasonable, baby, but I don't like you dealing with that alone. I'm not alone, she says, with a small smile tipping up her lips. No, beauty, you definitely are not. We have been sitting here for a while, just silently taking each other in when her voice breaks the stillness. Tell me about Grace. Trying to change the subject? I laugh, but I really am just happy she wants to know more about me. I just want to know you, all of you, even that beast you only seem to throw around toward me. She smiles and leans her head on my shoulder. Grace was amazing. We were best friends and each other's shadow our whole lives. She didn't take it well when I enlisted, but she knew it was what I wanted. Our dad was a career marine, and I knew before I could walk that that's what I would do. He was the bravest man we knew until we lost him. She knew what it meant to carry on his memory. We talked as often as we could, but that still wasn't enough. I met her boyfriend once when I was home on leave and didn't like the bastard. Told her, but she was in love, so there wasn't anything I could say. That was the only time we disagreed about anything. She married him shortly after I left. Twenty years old and ready to follow him around the world if he asked. I take a deep breath and think back to her beautiful smile and her violet eyes. You would have loved her. 
She was a lot like Dee, always happy. You know how I got the call. Needless to say, I didn't take that shit well. I went off the deep end. The second I could get out, I left the Marines and the only dream I've ever had behind and disappeared. Axel and the boys, hell, my own mother. No one knew where I was for almost two years. Met a guy on the road who helped me sort my shit, came back home and started my own company. The rest, as they say, is history. It gets better, losing the other part of you? She asks. I know what she means. Grace was the other part of my soul, and I'm guessing her sister was hers. Yeah, baby, it gets better. Never easy, but it gets better. That's good. I don't want to hurt anymore, she whispers. With me around, I'll do my best to make sure you never do. She pulls her head off my shoulder, shifts lightly, and brings her hands up to cut my face before dropping her forehead against mine. You're a good man, Greg Cage. You give me some time, and I might just fall in love with you. That's the plan, beauty, I whisper, and take her lips, delivering the message that I hope shows her how much I want to be worthy of that love. Chapter 18 Greg When I pull Melissa off the couch and lead her upstairs to my room, I know this will be more than just burning up the sheets. This is about communicating without words what needs to be shown and not said, giving her what she needs from me and making sure she feels it. I'm no blushing virgin, but even I am feeling the pressure to make sure this is something for the record books. When we reach my bedroom, I pull her close and drop my lips to hers, simple and slow. I make love to her mouth. This is a slow mating. We stand there with our arms wrapped around each other and just savor. Neither of us is in a hurry, but both of us are in need. Slowly we take turns peeling the clothes from each other's bodies, and when we are both naked, we just stand there, taking each other in. Her skin is flawless, glowing with a natural tan. Her tits make my mouth water and my dick jump. Those legs, my balls tighten, just taking in her long legs. I knew the backside is just as good as the front. She is pure perfection and beauty. You going to keep devouring me with your eyes, baby? There it is again, and this time she is wide awake. Baby. Reaching out and hooking her around the waist earns me a breathy sigh, and I smile down at her before returning my lips to hers. Still taking my time, I enjoy the slow kiss full of desire. My hands that rest right above her ass make the slow journey down until I have both of her globes in my hands. With a squeeze, I lift her up and am instantly rewarded when her legs wrap around my hips. My dick jumps at the contact with her wet heat. I offer her no words as I start walking toward the bed, continuing my assault on her mouth. She is clamped so tight to my body that there wasn't room for air between us. My body feels like it is moving on autopilot. I don't need my mind to tell my body what to do. I crave her, so this is like second nature. We have only been apart two damn days, and it seems like a year. Laying her down softly, I make the move to detach my lips from hers, but she tightens her arms and legs, and the soft moan she lets out is a straight shot to my dick. It's throbbing and begging me to thrust home, but this needs to be about her. When I am finally able to release her mouth, she looks up at me, and I can see the lust shining bright, but behind that, I swear I almost see adoration. I don't doubt that is what's reflecting in my own, but I never thought I would see it so soon in my beauty's gaze. So beautiful, I whisper, trailing my fingers down the side of her face, her neck, and her shoulders. My eyes follow my hand as it moves over her skin. Leaning my weight onto my side, I trail my hand down to her breast. Her pink nipple puckers and strains from my mouth, but I just roam my fingers over the soft skin. Her breathing comes in sharp pants, her skin prickles with goosebumps, and when I take her nipple between my fingers, giving it a soft tug and pinch, she arches off the bed and her quick intake of air echoes in the room. My dick might be in serious danger of early detonation if I don't hurry things along, but I can't seem to move away from her. She is just looking at me, eyes wide and so close to that lost look she gets right before she soars. 
Shifting down slightly, I take the other nipple in my mouth, swirling my tongue and hollowing my cheeks when I suck hard. She tastes delicious. Every part of her skin is mouth-watering. I move my hand down her body until I meet the bare, wet skin of her pussy. A ragged groan of my own crawls up my throat when I feel just how ready she is, and I push my rock-hard dick into her thigh, trying to ease some of the pressure. Fuck, my girl is ready for me, I say against her breast. Always ready for me. She hums something unidentifiable before grabbing the back of my neck and pushing her tit back to my mouth. I laugh softly against her skin before wrapping my lips around her tight bud and sucking deep, giving her everything she wants. This time, I hold nothing back. My teeth nibble, my tongue licks and swirls, and when I close my lips around the tight bud and pull, she screams out. So good, baby, she moans. I switch to her other side and give her some more attention, causing her hand in my hair to tighten. When I push two fingers deep inside her, she clamps down with a hold that's so fierce that I can barely move my fingers back out. Rubbing her clit with my thumb and hooking my fingers while pumping softly makes her moaning cry louder. She pulls my head back, and with one look, I know she's ready. My girl wants me, and she isn't afraid to let me know. Not yet, I whisper, pulling myself up to meet her lips. I devour her pouring myself into her with every mating of our tongue and thrust of my fingers. When I hit that spot inside that never fails to set her off, she pulls off my mouth and screams my name so loud I'm shocked the windows didn't shatter. I wait for her to come back down and give me her lazy eyes before I pull out and slowly lick my fingers clean, watching her eyes widen and her lips tip up slightly. Rolling off the bed, I walk over to the other side and grab a few condoms out of the side table, the whole time her eyes never leaving me. Or I should say, they never leave my dick, which I am sure at this point has turned purple. When I walk back to the other side and stand between her parted legs, her eyes still haven't left my straining erection. I throw all but one condom on the bed and take my dick in my hand. Her eyes flash as she watches me work myself. But when her pink tongue darts out and licks her lips, I have no doubt that I am two seconds away from shooting all over her flat stomach. Tearing open the condom, I make quick work of sheathing myself. For the first time in my life, I wish I could take her without the barrier. I understand her concerns, which is why I went to the clinic the first chance I had on Monday. Luckily, the doctor is an old friend of mine, and he promised results by the end of the week. Thank Christ, I couldn't wait to take my woman bare. Slide back some, baby. We will get creative later, but right now, I want to be able to watch your eyes when I take you. She doesn't waste any time moving back until her head is almost hanging off the edge. Never once closing her legs, her eyes no longer follow my dick. They are blazing up at me, begging me to hurry. I climb up and kneel between her legs, enjoying the look of her giving herself to me with no hesitation. Her eyes never leave mine as I lean forward and steady my weight over her body. Taking my dick in my hand and rubbing her wet center, a sharp gasp rewards me every time my ring hits her clit. Best damn bet I ever took was getting my dick pierced. She loves it, and she isn't shy about letting me know with each gasp or moan that leaves her body. I can't wait for her to feel it without the latex being between us. I lean down and brace myself with one arm by her ribs, keeping my knees apart and my dick pressed against her heat. Kissing her stomach before peppering more along the way to her neck, I slowly reach her ear. Biting it softly, I hum my approval when she moves her hips up trying to impale herself on my dick. I lean up and hold her eyes while I push just a few inches into her. She melts. No other word for it. She simply melts into the bed, at the same time pushing off with her feet to try and speed up my entrance. Patience, baby. Feel it. No way that this connection between us can be missed. It's no wonder I was a goner for her the second we locked eyes. She feels it, and there is no doubt about it when I thrust painfully slow into her body. Her eyes widen with each inch, and my hips settle against hers. Her legs hook around my back, her heels digging in. 
Her hands snake around my back and nails bite the skin when I shift my hips and my bass piercing rubs her clit. I lean forward and kiss her deeply before pulling back and resting my forehead against hers. Only then do I begin to slowly pull out until I almost lose her heat. When I push back in just as slowly, she tries to dig in again, begging me to speed up. Patience, baby. Let me love you. Her eyes widen and a sob catches in her throat. Just let me show you. Feel it, beauty. Oh my God, did he just say that? I can't even panic completely because he's right. There isn't anything about this that doesn't scream love. His gaze is blinding with it. His touch and the way he worships my body are testaments to the fact that this is nothing but pure lovemaking. It should terrify me. I should be running, but I can't. Even though it seems rash, there isn't a way possible to detangle myself from this man physically or mentally. He's right. I feel it. Right or wrong, regardless of how terrified I am, I will regret for the rest of my life if I don't explore this. I feel it, baby, I reply breathlessly. He seems shocked at first that I am voicing my agreement. His smile so wide, his eyes crinkle, hits his face, and his hips make their way back down before he speaks. Yeah, baby, feels like a dream, but so good I don't ever want to wake up. Oh, God. I have no willpower to resist him when he opens himself up like this. We continue to look into each other's eyes. Our lips are inches apart and our breath dances with each exhale. My fingers clench in the thick muscles along his back and my legs hold him tightly to me. When he hits my spot again, I know it will only be seconds before I lose it. I can feel my release already forming, growing, and slowly spreading through my body like a warm blanket. Ribbons of pleasure unfold from my belly. Tingles dance up my spine and my skin heats to the point of pain. So close, so close, I moan against his lips. He pulls forward again and rolls his hips, forcing the barbell to rub against my swollen clit. My release hits with such powerful force that I scream, claw at his back and grind myself against him like a hussy. Jesus, this man does things to my body that I have never felt. He keeps moving slowly as my arched back falls back down onto the bed, just watching me with his burning eyes. Yeah, you feel it, baby he says in a voice so rife with strain that I know he's working hard to keep his control. Amazing. He drops his head to my shoulder and rests it there for a few seconds, while he continues his slow, rhythmic assault. I rub my hands up and down his back, enjoying the soft growls that vibrate against my chest. Look at us, baby. His request seems odd until he lifts his head off my shoulder and repeats himself. Look at us. Watch me love you. Following his gaze down to where our bodies join, my eyes take in his thick length as it stretches my body to receive him. His dick is soaked with my release, and every time he disappears deep into my body, his piercing caresses my clit. We both watch for a few minutes, but when the pleasure becomes too much, my head presses against the bed as my eyes roll back and I clamp down on him again, screaming his name out into the expanse of his room and listening to it bounce off the walls. My sounds mingle with his own cry of release. We lay there trying to come back down for what felt like hours. Our combined sweat covering my skin begins to dry, leaving me chilled where his body isn't covering mine. We don't speak, but words aren't needed. I feel it, and he isn't wrong about that. Not only was that the most powerful sex I have ever experienced, but he wasn't wrong when he said that he was going to love me. I might already be halfway there myself. He rolls to the side, taking my cheek in his big hand and turns my head to meet his gaze. Whatever this might have been for you before now, baby, there is no trying or going slow. I know you felt it. It was all over your face. I feel like I just found a piece of myself that has been lost forever, a piece of the puzzle that I didn't even know was missing until you walked into my life. This, us, baby, I will work as hard as I can and then some to prove to you that you have nothing to fear. He catches a tear that leaks from my eye with his lips and follows that up with a kiss to my lips before leaving the bed and walking into the bathroom. I hear the shower turn on, and a few seconds later he returns, scoops me off the bed and carries me into the warm spray. 
after cleaning every inch of my skin and then his own, he shows me again what it feels like to be loved. When we finally fall back into the bed, he curls me tight into his body, and with his strong arms holding me close, I surrender to sleep. The last thought that filters through my mind before I fade off is that I don't feel so scared anymore if this is what love feels like. Chapter 19 Melissa It's been a little over a month since Greg and I officially became an us. It hasn't been perfect, but it's been damn near close. True to his word, a few days after Dr. Shannon fired me, Greg set up an interview with Dr. Roberts. He is an older family man who runs his own practice. Over the years, he has added more doctors to his team, and now he has a need for more nursing staff. He is one of those people you love to work for, and lucky for me, he wanted me on his team. I started the week after I was fired, and I'm the happiest I have ever been at work. It also helps that my pay jumped a lot. There are no more struggles, no more worrying about how I'm going to stretch my check to make sure that we're all comfortable. I've talked to Greg about helping me find a new apartment, since I can now afford rent in a nicer, safer complex. This is what started our first real fight— he doesn't see the need in my paying to live somewhere when I spend all my time at his place anyway. This, coincidentally, is because he took one look at my apartment and the neighborhood I lived in the day after we became us, turned right around without parking, and refused to take me back. I get where he is coming from, and to be honest, I have never felt safe there anyway. So if he wants to act like a grown toddler and keep me hostage, who am I to complain? It comes with one kick-ass house and the best sex ever. And to be completely honest, I don't want to be away from him. I still have my apartment, but the majority of my stuff has slowly started to make its way to his house. Some of it because I need it. But I'm starting to wonder if he's pocketing my belongings and moving them to his house when I'm not looking. Either way, we are pretty much living together at this point. Our second fight was over my car. Even though it was ready a few days after Mandy pulled her crazy on it, Greg, without letting me know, told the mechanic to sell it. The next day, a brand-new Honda sat in the driveway of his house. We fought about it for a good day. He had to endure my silence, but when he finally had enough, he calmly told me that he wanted me safe. My old car couldn't offer that, so he took care of it. When that didn't work, he pulled me close and said, Baby, after I lost Grace in a car accident, do you think you could please just give a little here? I want to know you are safe when I can't be with you. Yeah, call me whipped, but that is all it took. We have done all the traditional couple things. We date, we go out with friends, he met my mom, and we have tons and tons of sex. I am starting to believe that Greg Cage is unbelievably close to perfection. Things with Susan have also calmed down over the weeks. She's called a few times, but usually only when she is drunk out of her mind. Mom and I think she will eventually forget that Cohen exists and just leave us alone. One thing we don't have to worry about is Mandy. That is another promise that Greg kept. The next day, he drove me to the police station and helped me fill out the necessary reports to have a restraining order against her. Although he assures me that it won't ever be needed, he still feels better knowing it's there. He didn't tell me until later that week that he had a come-to-Jesus, as my mom calls it, with Mandy. I don't care what happens to the bitch, but according to him, she is back on her meds and seeking help. Back on the meds should have been clue enough that she really is a psycho bitch. Maybe next time she will keep up with those damn pills— all that matters is he says that she won't be a problem, and I believe him. About two weeks ago, I started to bring Cohen around. If there was any doubt left in my mind that Greg was a perfect man, watching him with my nephew squashed it. It is clear that he's meant to have children in his life, but when he started asking me about my plans for the future when it came to Cohen, I start to worry a little that maybe kids aren't something he wants. I can't help my fears. It all just seems so perfect that I keep waiting for it to happen and all this to just blow up in my face. So I told him the truth. I wanted Cohen. My mom wants me to have Cohen. He is a crazy-as-hell three-year-old boy who needs someone that can keep up with him. He smiled and told me that was a great plan, and then continued to sit there with me for hours and plan our future with Cohen in it. That was also the night that I realized I had fallen in love with him. 
We are closing in on autumn, and the weather is still nice enough to enjoy being outside for long periods. So here I am in Greg's kitchen, making lunch for the two most important men in my life. Greg and Cohen are spending some time doing what Cohen calls man fluff, no hips, which, when translated by a hysterical Greg, means man stuff fade, no chicks allowed. They left a few hours ago to do whatever it is that boys do. My mom has graciously taken me up on my offer to start having Cohen spend some weekends with me. Now that I have somewhere I feel safe enough to take him, we are finally spending some quality time together. I have just cut up the last sandwich when I hear the front door open and the little feet pound down the hall. Maui, Maui, look what I got! And like a flash, in comes Cohen with a bright red cape flapping behind him. Greg said this would help me fight ninjas. He said that all ninjas are scared of superheroes. He said that if I have a cape, I have magic. Magic powers that ninjas can't fight because they aren't superheroes, Melwee. Do you see? Can you see it? The whole time he is giving this speech, he doesn't once take a breath. By the time he's finished, he has to take a few deep ones just to stay on his feet. I look over and see Greg leaning against the door frame, his arms crossed over his thick chest and a huge grin on his face. I give him one of my own before turning my attention back to Cohen, who is now spinning in circles and kicking his feet out every few seconds. My guess, he's fighting ninjas now and completely forgotten about us. Come here and let me see your powers, little man. I can already tell that the ninjas are going to be so scared of you. I bet they don't even come near Nana's house anymore. He stops his weird twirl kicking and jumps into my arms. Can you feel my power? He whispers loudly into my face. Greg said that I have powers against you, too, he says, still whispering loudly. Oh, he does, does he? I ask and look over at Greg, watching as his silent laughter shakes his body. Oh, my man, not something you're supposed to tell the ladies. Greg laughs in response to Cohen and walks over to ruffle his hair. All right, tell me, little guy, what kind of powers do you have against me? I can make you love me, he laughs and looks over at Greg, nodding his little head. Greg said that I can make you love me and all I have to do is smile. He told me it worked on him, so it has to be magic powers, Maui. He told me. He said all I have to do is smile and everyone falls in love with me because I'm special like that. Oh, shit. My throat is closed up now and I can feel my eyes prickling. I'm going to cry. He did? I croak. Maui, what's wrong with your face? You look funny. Like that time you dropped something on your foot and yelled that really bad word. Your face looks like that. He takes both my cheeks in his small hands and moves my head around, studying every inch. Yeah, you look funny. Then he wiggles to get down and takes off running through the house, yelling for the ninjas to watch out because he's going to hunt them down. You should probably go make sure he doesn't destroy the house, I whispered to Greg, who's now pulling me into his arms. Don't care about anything in the house he can break. Not even your brand new flat screen? I question, still trying to control my emotions. Nope. Not even that really expensive computer? Not even that. You love him? He bends slightly and places a kiss on my nose. When he pulls back, I can see it. His smile is huge, all the way to his eyes, making his laugh lines deepen. Those blue eyes I love so much are sparkling with humor, but clear as day, I can see it. Yeah, beauty, I love him. Oh, pathetic, but that's all I have for him. I'm sure my funny face just got funnier. I can't stop the tears if I try. The thought of this man who has already stolen my heart, loving Cohen as much as I do, is just too much to hold in. Babe, how can you be so blind when your eyes are wide open? Even if he wasn't the coolest kid I've ever met, even if I didn't enjoy the hell out of my time reliving my childhood with the little guy, he is part of you. No, he isn't yours, and I understand that, but he is part of you and beauty. How can I not love that? Oh, God. Oh, I repeat and crash my head into his chest. He laughs a few times before cupping my face and lightly pulling my head off his chest. Oh, that's all you got for me? He jokes. How he can joke right now is beyond me. What do you want me to say? You need to be clear with me, baby, because I don't want to misinterpret something you could be saying right now. My voice sounds funny, and the tears have already started falling freely. He just keeps smiling down at me, both of his warm palms against my neck, and his thumbs keep sweeping away my tears. All the while, he just keeps smiling. All right. 
I love having you in my house, going to sleep with your body pressed close to mine and waking up with you still in my arms. I love coming home and having dinner with you in my house, watching movies on the couch with you laying on top of me. I love getting your calls every time something ridiculous happens that you just can't wait to tell me about. I love Cohen. He's amazing. And one day I would love to be a permanent part of his life. But I don't love him because he's great. No, I want to be a permanent fixture in his life because I am deeply in love with his aunt. Beauty, I love you. You love me? I whisper again after a few moments of just taking him in. Yeah, I do. Completely. His strong voice wraps around me, and his love is like a blanket of warmth. I can feel it like a tangible thing taking over the room. I love you, too. God, I do. So much. My silent tears have turned into sobs now. He lets my face go for a second, but only to pick me up by my hips and sit me down on the countertop. My legs open automatically, and he steps in arms going around my body as he tucks my head into his neck. Baby, best I can see this is a good thing. Why are you crying about it? he asks, his voice rumbling against my ear. He stands there with my head against his chest and lets me have my moment, silently being my rock, my strength, and just lets me have this. When I hear some loud bangs and Cohen's battle cry of victory, I know it's only a matter of time before our moment is interrupted. I pull back and wipe my eyes before looking into Greg's eyes. You love me? I ask again, but this time letting my happiness show, and I smile so big, it even hurts a little. He throws his head back and his laughter rings out around us. Yeah, I do. That's good. You're wrong, babe, he says with a smile. It's not good. It's fucking amazing. Since it is Sunday and Greg and I both start work pretty early, we bring Cohen home before dinner so that we can go out and have some us time before the week starts. This is also something we try to do during the week. When things get crazy at the core security offices, it is sometimes past dinner when he gets home. So if we have time, we make it a point to spend special time like this together. Superco, which is what we have been instructed to call Cohen now, takes off into my mom's house the second Greg parks. His cape flaps in the wind behind him, and we can already hear him starting his speech with my mom. Greg walks over and takes my hand before we head into the house. When we make it to the kitchen, Cohen is still screaming about all his magic. Oh, my, that is some good news, baby! My mom smiles at us and gives Cohen a big kiss, before he runs off to his room to make sure there aren't any ninjas. That boy is so funny sometimes, she says, shaking her head. Melly Kate, come here, baby! I let Greg go and walk into her arms. You look happy today, she whispers in my ear. I am, I whisper back. I really am. That's good, baby. You deserve that. She pulls back and gives me a kiss on my forehead before turning to my man. Come here, handsome, and give this old lady some thrills. And here starts my mother's weekly enjoyment in my boyfriend and embarrassing me at every turn. Lily, he says and walks up wraps his arms around her and lifts her off her feet in a big hug. She laughs loud and slaps him playfully in the arm when he lets her down. Such a strong man! Take my girl home and show her a good night! She giggles and I turn beet red. Mom, Jesus! They both laugh, enjoying this new tag team effort to embarrass me. We stay in the kitchen for a while before Greg excuses himself to go say goodbye to Cohen. How did I miss how much he cares for my nephew for so long? I don't realize that I've been looking at the empty hallway in a daze until my mother's soft laughter curls around me. Oh, my darling girl, you have it bad. I look over and smile at my mother. Her eyes are misting with emotion, but sadness isn't one of them. Her smile is huge, and you can tell she is happy for me to have found this. You have no idea just how bad I have it. He's incredible, Mom, and he loves Cohen. Can you believe it? He loves that crazy kid just as if he were his own, just like we do. I know that, baby. Could have saved you the trouble of figuring out all this on your own, but I knew you would get there. He's a keeper, Mary Kate. I know I don't have the best record when it comes to judging men. First with your father, and then, well, I just don't. 
But with a man like that, there is no doubt. He is the kind of man you dream of, baby. Don't ever let your past cloud that knowledge. I won't. I love you, Mama. I know that, sweetheart. We give each other a hug and sit down to chat about things happening this week, while we wait for the boys to do their thing. About thirty minutes or so later, Greg comes walking back in, laughing. He was just mid-sentence and fell asleep. We were sitting there talking about the best ways to take out flying ninjas, and bam, his little head just face planted into my lap, and he was out. Lily, I went ahead and changed him into pajamas so he wouldn't have to bother with that. She smiles brightly at him, leans in, and whispers in my ear, "Caper." Not long after that, we leave and head downtown to our favorite burger joint. We have just sat down when his phone rang, and he excuses himself to take the call outside. He has only been gone a few minutes when he comes back inside, looking agitated. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Just some shit from Axel, but no big deal. Look, I ran into Mandy outside. Nothing happened, but let's get out of here, okay? Damn, just when you think that woman is gone for good. Sure, baby. We pay the bill and get our meals boxed up. On the way out, I see Mandy standing next to a few girlfriends. Doesn't bother me to see her, but what does bother me is the look she gives me. She might fool others, but I can see the pure evil behind that carefully crafted mask, and I just know she isn't done with us. That night, after three mind-blowing orgasms, I lay wrapped in Greg's arms and asked him about his call with Axel. I had forgotten that when he mentioned Mandy, that he looked upset. More upset than he normally is in seeing her face. I don't like knowing he is bothered with anything. If there is a chance, I can help it. Baby, I question, lifting my head off his chest. Hmm. He responds, still running his fingers across my back. His eyes are closed and his face is blank but peaceful. What did Axel want tonight? His eyes snap open, and a look that I don't like at all replaces his blank expression. He's hiding something, doing a shit job at it. Nothing, beauty. Just some shit we've been discussing for a while now. I could press, and my gut is telling me I should, but my pride is stopping me. I know him, and whatever is bothering him is cutting him deep. He'll tell me when he's ready, but I hate thinking there's a secret between us. Okay, if you want to talk, just let me know. His eyes flash, but whatever it is that was there is gone before I can figure it out. I know. Love you, beauty. Love you too. For the first time in weeks, my sleep isn't peaceful. Chapter Twenty. Greg. I have been lying in bed with Melissa draped across my body for the last two hours, unable to fall asleep. Today had been a perfect day, but when Axel called, and two seconds into the conversation asked me if I had told her yet, my mood quickly went to shit. When we weren't doing this back and forth debate over why it was so important that I do it right now, it turned heated before I could stop it. I know he is right. I need to tell Melissa my connection with Simon Wagner, and I needed to do it yesterday. The more time that goes by, the more the ball of worry grows in my gut. I don't think she would have taken it so bad if I told her sooner, but now that we are both solidly invested in this relationship and our feelings are finally put out there, well. I don't think this is going to go well. Turning around after biting out, I'll fucking tell her about Simon tomorrow. Just shut the fuck up about it. And seeing Mandy standing behind me is not a welcome sight. There's no telling how long she has been there, but any amount of time is too long. I have stupidly just let it all out, and if she has been there long enough, she knows the one thing that I am keeping from my girl, the one thing that might have the power to come between us. I don't even spare her a second of my time. I walk in, grab my girl, and get the hell out of there. And not once since that phone call has my heart calmed down. I need to tell her and then deal with the fallout. I can tell when she questions me about Axel's call that she doesn't completely believe what I have to say, with good reason too, since she knows me well enough to know I am keeping something from her. The next morning isn't much better. We both oversleep, so by the time we make it downstairs, we have just enough time for a quick kiss before we head to work. I follow behind her and watch her pull off into her office before continuing down the street to Core. Things around here have thankfully been quiet over the last few weeks. Luckily, the gold sidewalk seems to keep Sway in a good enough mood that he doesn't mess with us nearly as much as he used to. 
I did catch him sprinkling glitter on Coop a few times, and that is enough to keep us all laughing for a week, at least. Emmy is doing better, but I can still see some pain in her eyes. She has decided it is best to distance herself completely from Maddox. I don't know if that is something she is consciously doing, but he isn't happy about it. I have just sat down to start looking over emails when my door opens and Axel walks in. You still have that stick up your ass? He says and sits down in front of me. Fuck off. Oh, so I see. Not only is the stick still there, but you might have just shoved that shit a little higher, huh? Jesus Christ, what? What do you want me to say? No, we didn't talk last night because once I got off the phone with you, which was already interrupting our dinner, I had to walk right into motherfucking Mandy. So no, by the time I got home and loved my woman good, I wasn't in the mood to taint that shit. He leans back and lets out a long huff. I get you, man, I do. But that shit is not going to be pretty. You don't think I already know this? I'm not looking forward to not only opening those old wounds, but rubbing salt in them when I tell her. You don't think I feel guilty enough? I could have stopped him, Axel. I could have stopped him, but instead of sticking around, I took off for years of booze and pussy to try and forget. I let him slip through the cracks, and in turn, the man who killed my sister married hers. Oh, pretty fucking hilarious move by fate there. Throwing us together, finally, only to have that between us. Seriously, G? That's what's been eating you? How in the fuck do you feel like it could even remotely be your fault that he ended up with her sister? You didn't introduce them. You didn't pull the fucking trigger. So I just don't understand how you are adding one and one and getting five. He leans forward and rests his elbows on his knees before continuing. Brother, that isn't on you, so don't hold it there. But it is, Axel. It is. And that is the root of the problem. After Grace died, I was too torn up to stick around and deal with anything. My mother lost her damn mind and spent the years I disappeared slowly letting her heart wither away. By the time I had my head pulled out of my ass and got back to her, she wasn't doing well. She made it another year before I lost her, too. My head wasn't in the right place to deal with Simon Wagner. By the time I started my business in Atlanta and finally tracked him down, I was shocked to learn he was just a few counties over and had remarried. That was when I started to keep an eye on him when I could. And when I couldn't, I had Derek. What a fucking joke. You need to get it done, but you also need to stop blaming yourself for shit that is not your fault. Hear you, brother, but that doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you right now. After a few minutes of silence, he leaves me to my silent brooding. Melissa calls a little while later to let me know she is going to go out with Izzy and the girls for dinner tonight. Hopefully that means she will have a few glasses of wine and come home in a good mood. But this also gives me a chance to work up my nerve to have the talk with her that I have been putting off for weeks. Hey, Greg, Emmy says as she walks into my office and puts some files on my desk. Did she talk to you? By the way she stresses the word she, I know she isn't talking about Melissa. They have become thick as thieves recently, and unless I've missed a major fight, they still are. Uh, she would be who? I ask. Seriously? God, I can't stand that woman. Mandy. She was here about an hour ago. Walked past while I was on the phone so I couldn't stop her. I think you were talking with Axel. Anyway, she was right back and out the door a few minutes later, so I just assumed you had kicked her out of here. Fuck, I hiss. She was here? Um, yes? I can tell she looks slightly worried that I am this pissed about Mandy showing up. She has already started backing out of the office when I shake myself clear of the fury raging. Emmy, not upset with you. Next time you see her, do not let her pass those doors. Drop the phone if you have to. Hell, throw the damn thing at her. But she doesn't make it two steps into this building, yeah? Sure, okay, Greg. She furrows her brow and makes a hasty retreat out the door. God damn it. This is not another kink that I need in my day. Who the fuck knows what Mandy wants now? But I know one thing. No good is going to come with finding out. The day gets worse and then worse again as it goes on. There isn't a damn thing except Melissa's lunchtime hello call that is bright and happy about it. By the time I get home, I'm in such a shit mood and exhausted from my mind, running wild all day, that I crash on the couch and pass out within a few minutes of clicking on the TV. 
which is unfortunate for me. Since I am sleeping, I miss all of the phone calls from Izzy, then Dee, and Emmy, and finally Axel a few hours later. The one call I don't miss is from Melissa, and that is because it never came. Chapter 21 Melissa Work has been typically normal. Dr. Roberts is in a good mood, so it's easy to follow his lead. I am still a little worried about Greg and what is bothering him, but I am determined to make today a good one. I make sure to call him a few times during the day just to make sure he's okay, and each time his voice sounds more and more troubled. I hate knowing he is hurting even if it's something he is keeping from me. It still hurts to know he feels like he needs to. When Izzy calls with the idea of an impromptu girls' night, I am all over that. I'm not avoiding going home, but I'm still not eager. I get off work early and run home to change out of my scrubs before heading over to Hebby's to meet the girls. I pass Greg on the way out, but he isn't watching the other lane and doesn't see me. I consider calling, but figure I won't be gone long, so there isn't a need. When I get home, I will sit him down and ask him to talk to me. I know my man, and he might not want to tell me what is hanging over his head, but if I ask, he will. I get to Heavy's right when Dee and Izzy are pulling up. Dee bounces over with her carefree smile firmly in place. Hey, you! Don't you look all casual hot tonight, Izzy! She screams over her shoulder. You see this? This is how you pull off jeans and tees. Shut it, Dee. I haven't worn mine in years. You know why? Because you threw them all out, like a deranged fashion fairy. Who does that? She laughs at Dee. These two have the kind of friendship that anyone would be envious of. I am beyond lucky to have them in my life. You two are crazy, you know that? Where's Emmy? I look around the parking lot but don't see her or her car. I pass Greg on the way over, so I know she isn't at the office anymore. He never leaves with her still there. They both exchange looks, the kind of looks that communicate everything with just one glance. What? Did something happen? Emmy and I are growing the kind of friendship that Izzy and Dee have, the thought that something is wrong with her hits me hard. I know she is dealing with her feelings for Maddox, and after what happened at Izzy and Axel's wedding, I think we decided it is best to back off for a while. That girl, her heart is too big for her own body. No, nothing happened, but I know Matt is sick of her freezing him out, according to Coop, who heard it from Beck, who heard it from Sway. They had it out in the parking lot this afternoon. I don't know much after that. Axel doesn't know what happened because he took the afternoon off to keep Nate so I could get some work done. I called her and she sounded fine, but she says she wants to stay in tonight. Izzy finishes speaking and turns to walk inside. That's it? You just let her off the hook with some lame excuse? You guys know her. If something's happened, she's hurting. Melly, there isn't anything we can do. She has to realize on her own that he isn't going to come around. I told her I would stop by before I went home. She needs this time. I look at Dee as if she has lost her damn mind. The last person that should give Emmy any sort of relationship advice is Dee. Love her, but damn, she is just as screwed up. Really, Dee? Is that the path you decided to use between you and Beck? She flinches, and I instantly regret my jab. I'm sorry, Dee, that wasn't cool. I've got some shit on my mind, and I didn't mean to take it out on you. It's okay. Really, I know y'all don't understand where I am with Beck, because I have never told you. I just know what it's like to want the impossible, okay? Give her some time. She gives me a weak smile before turning and walking over to Izzy, who is impatiently waiting to get inside. For such a small thing, she puts away barbecue like a grown man. We have been enjoying our dinner for a while and discussing everything that has been going on since our last get-together. We try to make girls' night at least once a week, but because of Nate's being sick last week and Dee having to go up to North Carolina to deal with something at her other office, it has just been me and Emmy. What's going on up at the other branch? You seem to be doing bi-weekly trips these days. From my understanding, she has the other branch at her insurance company so fine-tuned that she could disappear for a year and it would be fine. Even Greg says that he's impressed with the crew she has running it. She sighs deeply and looks around. Do not tell the boys, okay? I don't want them dealing with it until I know more. There are some inconsistencies in the books. Payments coming in on big policies, but the records are all over the place and it looks like there are some funds that are missing. I'm taking care of it. I just don't want the guys going in guns blazing and causing more trouble than necessary. Um, Dee, I hate to point out the obvious, but how exactly are you going to take care of this without one of them catching wind? 
You know they wouldn't do anything without asking first. Izzy knows them better than I do, but even I think she is full of shit. If they know that one of their girls is in trouble, they will move heaven and earth to fix the problem. I decide it was wiser to keep my mouth shut at this point and watch them hash this shit. I have it under control, Izzy. Once I figure out what's going on, I will let them know and they can help me figure out where to go from there. I don't want this made into a big deal. I could lose clients if this got out. Not to point out the obvious, I interrupt. But isn't Maddox like computer geek to the stars? He could probably hack into the servers up there and figure out the trail before you even had time to fly up there. Why not let him in and get it done quick? That's not a bad idea, Dee, Izzy chimes in. No, you know he might be all silently supportive of you, Izzy, but if he knows there's trouble, he won't keep his mouth shut. I think you're wrong, but then again, you know them better than I do. I'm going to run to the restroom and hit up the bar for a refill. Y'all want something other than beer? I get up from the table and let them have a moment to hash it out. Izzy can get through to her better than I can. Maybe if I hadn't been running through all the things that might be wrong with Dee and her company, or between Emmy and Maddox, or what is wrong with Greg, I might have noticed the trap I was walking straight into. I take two steps into the bathroom, and there she is, legs braced apart and arms folded over her ridiculously large tits. She has what I assume is a scowl on her Botox face. Jesus, what do you want? You do realize you're breaking your restraining order, right? I ignore her and continue into the stall. When I finish up, she is still standing there in the same position. Hard to tell if she is glaring at me or if her face is frozen. What? You really don't want to piss me off tonight, Mandy. Like, really do not want to. Where is your boyfriend tonight? God, even her voice makes me want to poke my ears with knives. Where my man is definitely isn't any of your business. How about you tell me what this shit is about so I can get back to enjoying my evening and get back to my man? You really are a stupid bitch. She throws her head back and laughs. Sounds like an evil little troll. I walk over to her and get close. Close enough to make sure if she pisses me off, I can take care of her without too much effort. What do you want? I drive each word home with small jabs into her fake tits. Hmm, they even feel rock hard. Surely that isn't the look you paid for. Shut up, she squawks. Yes, squawks. The sound that comes out of her mouth sounds like the noise you hear when you're standing on the beach and millions of seagulls attack. This bitch is insane. Mandy, I'm tired, and I don't want any shit right now. Can you please just get this shit moving? Tell me, does Greg tell you everything? Is it complete happiness in paradise? I know how to please a man like him, and I can promise you he isn't happy. He likes it a certain way, and I doubt you have that kind of spunk. Spunk? Do you know what the hell spunk is? Trust me, honey, when it comes to Greg, I get plenty of spunk out of it. She looks at me confused for a few seconds, clearly confused by my comment. I had a friend in high school that had just moved to America from London, and every time my mom would call her spunky, she would die. She said that to her, spunk has always meant sperm. We like to call people spunky when they were pissing us off, because to us, being called sperm was hilarious. I don't care how old you are, that shit never gets old. What? Never mind, answer me. Do you two have any secrets? I know you do, which is a shame, because he never kept anything from me. My stomach drops, because even though I know she is batshit crazy, we do have secrets. Or at least he has secrets from me. Two days ago, I would have laughed in her face and maybe popped one of her tits, but today? No, today I already have that seed of doubt planted so deep all she did was water it and watch it grow. Really? Are you this demented that you need to start making up lies? The smug smile that curls her fake features chills me to the bones. Went to see him today. When he saw me last night, he begged me to come to the office and talk with him. I knew it would only be a matter of time before he was sick of you, so I waited. I waited, and I was right. But I was shocked to learn just why he was done with you. Mandy, you're fucking nuts. I'm gone. Not going to stand here and listen to you lie about my man. You hear that? And get it through your fucking head. He is not yours, and he never will be. I move to walk around her, but she sidesteps me, blocking my path to the door. Who is Simon, Melissa? Her question stops me cold. How in the hell would she know about Simon? I don't know what you're talking about, Mandy. Is this a new man you plan on getting your hooks in? Thank God my voice comes out strong, despite how I feel on the inside. On the inside, I am slowly dying. 
There is no way in hell she would know about Simon if it didn't come from Greg. Oh, you stupid, stupid girl. Let me fill you in on what I know. Was your sister married? Hmm, maybe married to Simon. Well, what you don't know and what your darling Greg is keeping from you is that Simon was also married to his sister. It takes everything I have, every single ounce of control not to react to her words. She doesn't wait before landing the final blow. You know what he told me today? He told me he was sick of looking at you because every time he did, all he could think about was how you were connected to the man who killed his sister. He couldn't stand to be around you any longer because you remind him of everything he hates. She spits the last word out, and even though I'm sure all the color has drained from my face, I stand my ground and offer her nothing. You will have to do better than that if you plan to scare me off, Mandy. Have a good night. I walk around her and down the hall. I don't even see the bar around me or the patrons enjoying their meals and laughing at all the happiness in their world. The happiness in mine has just been stripped from my body. I feel completely gutted. How does she know about Simon? She knows about Fia and Grace. If I even could believe her, that means Greg has been keeping something huge from me. Grace was married to Simon? He knew this the whole time I had been opening up to him about Cohen, my sister, her death. He knew who Simon was, and he knew who Cohen was. Oh, my God! He could have stopped him. As soon as the thought hits my brain... I almost fall over the enormity of the situation. Greg's sister died over a decade ago, and he knew Simon did it. He told me he disappeared after it happened, but if he would have stuck around and made sure Simon paid, then my sister would still be here. My heart is pounding so quickly, and my breathing is coming too fast. I have to get out of here. I make it back to the table, but the girls must have had their eyes on me because they are up in a second and by my side. Nellie, what's wrong? Izzy, or maybe it was Dee, asks. I just shake my head and reach for my purse. Nellie, please talk to us. What happened? Pretty sure it was Dee that time. Is that fucking Mandy? One of them asks, and my body jolts at the name. I have to get out of here before Mandy sees that her words have had their desired effect. I can break down and lose it later, but I will be damned if I let her have the satisfaction of watching me do it. Not here! I croak and pull some cash from my wallet. After throwing it down, I take off to the door, making sure I don't give away to Mandy how upset I am. I feel like someone has just removed my heart. My skin feels tight and my face hurts from holding my emotions in check. The burn that has taken up residence in my chest is making its way up my throat, and I know that in seconds I won't be able to hold back the sobs. Mally, wait! Please! I can feel Izzy running up to me, but I have my car in sight and escape on the horizon. Melissa! She grabs my arm hard enough to prevent me from walking any further and turns me to her. I can feel my tears bubbling over, and when I open my mouth to tell her to drop it, I hardly recognize the sound that escapes. It's the sound of my heart shattering into millions of unbreakable pieces. Sweetie, what is going on? Did you know... I whisper, my voice wobbling and the tears still streaming down my face. Did you know? I ask again with more force. She jerks back slightly at my question. Her brow furrows and she shakes her head. Mally, I have no idea what you're talking about. Did I know what? I shake my head a few times and try to get to my car again. I don't know where Mandy is, but I know with that bomb she isn't going to miss her chance to make sure it hit its mark. I have to leave, Izzy. I can't be here when I fall apart, I beg. You can't drive either. Come on, you can come with me and I'll take you home. No, I start to force my way around her, but she holds firm. Jesus, I have the size advantage on her short frame. How is she able to hold me back? I'm not going home, not going to him. She seems even more confused at how fiercely I am refusing to go to Greg. Please, I can't go home. My strength is crumbling and my body is trying to shake with the effort it is taking to hold it in. Fine, sweetie, that's fine. Come on, let's figure out where you want to go while we're on the road, okay? She folds me in the seat, hands me my purse, and makes quick work in getting around the car and taking off. I have no idea where I am going to go, but I know I can't see Greg right now. At this point, 
I don't know if I will ever be able to face him again. The last thing I see before we pull out of the lot is Mandy bursting through the front of heavies with D hot on her heels. She looks around, but when she doesn't see what she is looking for, she turns on D and starts waving her hands around. At least I'm out of there before she's able to watch me crumble. I can hear Izzy asking me where to go and talk on her phone a few times, but I am in my own world. I pull my legs up toward my body and welcome the tears. Chapter 22 Greg When I wake up on the couch, I am slightly confused. The house is still dark and silent, but glancing at the clock and seeing it is well past midnight, I know something is wrong. Melissa would never let me stay on the couch if she had already come home. Damn, I am exhausted. I feel like the stress of keeping something from the girl I love is slowly eating at me. I know this talk isn't going to be easy, but it needs to be done. I just have to have enough faith in us and our love to know that she will be able to forgive me for keeping it from her. Pulling myself off the couch and stretching my sore muscles from sleep, I take off in search of my girl. Maybe I didn't do such a good job letting her know that everything is okay. She knows something is off, but I don't think she could be so mad that she wouldn't come home. Sure, we have had our share of fights, but they have been over little things like leaving the lid off the toothpaste. Ten minutes later, I am officially starting to worry. She isn't here. Not only is she not here, but it doesn't look like she's been here since before I got home. All of her stuff is still here, but she isn't. I spend another ten minutes searching for my cell phone only to come up lacking. Jesus, I am losing my mind. I start to panic slightly when I realize if I don't have my phone, there is no way she would have been able to get a hold of me if something bad had happened. What if she was in an accident? Fuck! She could be in the hospital right now and I've been sleeping. I finally locate the little bastard under my seat in the truck and almost fall to the ground when I see the amount of missed calls. One from Axel, one from Emmy, two from D, but it is the sixteen from Izzy that stops my heart. When I finish going through all the messages, I still don't completely understand what is happening. Emmy seems confused and clueless. She lets me know that she didn't go out with the girls, but she did talk to Izzy, and I need to call her as soon as possible. Dee's first message is just as confusing as Emmy's. Her second message, however, turns my blood to ice. Gee, I don't know what happened. Melly went to the bathroom and came out looking like she had just seen a ghost. She's gone, but I do know Mandy did something. That little bitch isn't speaking, though. You need to find her, G. Something's wrong, but I don't know what. Call Izzy. She left with her a little while ago. Love you. Mandy, what a motherfucking cunt. Who knows what she could have told Melissa, but whatever it is, it couldn't be good. Why did I think she is done and over her obsession with my dick? The last chat I had with her had ended well enough. She apologized over and over and promised she wished me nothing but the best. I guess my first clue should have been when she mentioned getting back on her medication. Fuck. When I listen to Izzy's messages that start out worried and end defeated, I know my bad luck has just turned to worse. She gives me nothing more than D did. Apparently my girl is locked up tight and not letting anyone in. I am pacing the living room when Axel's message finally comes through the line. She's here, and you need to stay away, brother. I know this is going to be impossible for you, but trust me when I say she is safe, and I will make sure she stays that way. She knows. And when I say that, you know what I mean. Iz didn't say much, just that Mandy told her about Simon. Would love to know how that bitch knew enough to put your woman in this state. Let her cool and be here in the morning. And, gee, if you tell Izzy I let you know she's here, I'll personally cut your dick off. Thank Christ she is safe, but that does nothing to ease the tension in my heart. I need to protect my girl. I need to be there. With not one care to the fact that it is way too late to be calling, I call Axel right back. What, motherfucker? He grumbles in the phone. Is she okay? What the fuck do you think? I have my woman in there with your woman because she hasn't stopped crying since she got here. I am not a chick, and I like my dick, so I didn't listen in for long, but there was a lot of her saying shit I know she will regret, and even more of her saying shit I know she won't. Not following, Axel. What are you saying? What I'm saying is, if you come over here right now, I don't think you will like what you get from her. She's hurt, 
and I told you this would blow up, so I have to say I agree with her pain. But she is also in shock. She's saying shit that I don't think she would be saying if she had a clear head. You love her. Then you need to sit your fucking ass at home and let Izzy be the strength she needs. I don't know how to do that, Axe. I sigh and pull my hand through my hair. Every instinct I have is telling me to run, run to her, and pick up the pieces. I know you don't, but it's time to learn. You can't always be the one that makes it better. You can't protect everyone from everything. That's what got you in this mess. There is some shuffling in the background, and I can hear him walking through his house, shutting some doors. Let me look in on them. Will that help you a little? Please, I whisper. Hold on. He sets the phone down, and after what seems like an eternity, I hear him pick back up and just sigh. She's asleep, curled up like a fucking baby in Izzy's arms. She's okay, G, but you have to give her this time. I'll call in the morning, yeah? Axe, I don't know if I can do this. I feel like part of my soul is being ripped from my body. I know. Trust me, I do. I lived that for twelve years, my man. The only thing I can give you is hope. Izzy and I went through our share of bumps, but in the end, if it's meant to be, nothing can keep your woman from your arms. He disconnects and I sit there for hours, until the early rays of sunlight start filling the room. I sit there and think about what I'm going to do if I can't fix this, because right now I know I won't be able to recover if she doesn't want to be in my life anymore. It will be like losing Grace all over again. I have been staring at one of the romance books Melissa left on the coffee table the night before, just zoning when the phone finally rings. Seeing that it is Axel, I have the phone connected into my ear in seconds. Yeah, even in my own ears I can hear the raw desperation that hangs from that single word. She left, Greg. I was changing Nate, and she and Izzy were downstairs, gone for five minutes, but when I got back down she was already gone. Izzy won't tell me where she went because she said she just needs this time. Fuck, I'm sorry. She's gone? I question. She's gone. With each word, the hope I have been hanging on to is slowly dying. She didn't have her car here, so I think it would be a safe bet that one of the other girls has her. Didn't hear that from me, though. I have to live with one of them, and I would prefer to be whole. Check in, yeah? I don't know if I answered him. I might have. But when the dial tone's beep meets my ears, I wake up and disconnect the line. I sit there even longer, wondering what the hell I'm supposed to do now. I look back at the book sitting on the coffee table and wish that love was as easy as it is in romance books. Sure as shit would make what I am feeling right now a little bit easier if I know there is a happy ending right around the corner. Even the dude on the cover seemed to be mocking me. Looking at me like I should have known better than to even try to keep something from the woman I love. Fuck me, but I should have. I'm getting ready to get up when I notice the title, Withstanding Me by Crystal Spears. Oh, irony. You really are a douchebag. I make it about thirty minutes before I am in the truck and heading to Lily's house. I'm not even expecting Melissa to be there, but I need to speak with someone that's not attached to me as a friend. I need someone on her side that will understand her. Since it is Tuesday and Cohen spends his mornings at a daycare center for some interaction with other children, I know it will be easier to have a chat with Lily. I just hope like hell that she doesn't hate me when I finish laying it all out there. Greg, what are you doing here, honey? Her smile is bright when she answers my knock, but as soon as she sees my face her smile drops and she wavers slightly before grabbing her chest. Millie Kate? Oh, Lord, is my baby okay? What? Oh, God, Lily, I'm sorry. I didn't even think what it would look like just showing up. She's okay. I just needed to talk. Oh, thank God. Sure thing, darling. Just come on in and let me get the laundry switched over. I follow her down the short hallway and have a seat at the kitchen table. She brings in a load of towels and sits with a smile. All right, lay it out, honey. Tell me what's on your mind. I don't even know where to start. In my experience, the best place is always the beginning, she says softly and pats my leg. So I do. I start from the beginning and tell her about Grace, how I dealt with Grace's death, starting the business, Izzy and her issues, and finally, Melissa, 
Never once does she look at me with disgust. She sits there patiently, listening to me lay it all out and just folds her towels. I expect her to kick me out when I tell her about how I knew Simon, but she just nods her head and continues folding. Finally, when I finish, I sit back and wait for it. Surely she wouldn't want a piece of shit like me around her daughter. You have a good heart, Greg. I knew that the second you walked in the door with Cohen on your shoulders and a big smile on your face. Never once in the last month have I worried about Medicaid. Seems like all I've done since I lost my Sophia was worry about that girl. She wasn't happy and she didn't live. I saw her happiness come back when she met you. So I might not understand completely why you didn't just tell her in the beginning. But I know you didn't mean to hurt my baby. No, ma'am. I would rather cut off my own arm than ever hurt her. But that's what I did anyway. Trying not to hurt her. I did, and now I have no idea if it can be fixed. Sweet child, true love can always be fixed. When you love someone as much as you and my Medicaid love each other, there isn't a single mountain in the world too high to climb when things need to be fixed. I take a deep breath and try to control the turbulence that is wreaking havoc on my body. I can't lose her. And it is as simple as that. Losing her would be unimaginable. And you won't, dear. She needs time to process this. I know my girl, she is hurting, but she is staying away because she needs to figure out her head. Her heart will fix her quick and she'll be ready to talk. For the first time since Axel's call this morning, I have a small feeling that maybe there is some hope and it will be okay. At this point I have to believe that because if Lily isn't right, I don't know what I'll do. How do you not blame me, Lily? I whisper the words into my hand and almost hope that she misses them. Blame you for what, exactly? Blame you for suffering a terrible loss? Oh, honey, you are just as big a victim here as we are. You lost someone you loved dearly, and no one would ever fault you for how you chose to deal with that. Everyone grieves differently. You did what you could to protect my Sophia, even when you didn't know her. And, honey, the only thing that does is make me love you a little more. None of this, what's happening with you and Malachi, or what happened to your Grace or my Sophia, should ever be on your shoulders to bear. Your heart has been in the right place all along. You just didn't realize it. I haven't had a mother figure in my life for so long, and with everything that's happened since yesterday, it just becomes too much at that point. Knowing that Melissa's own mother doesn't look at me and wish me dead after knowing everything almost makes me feel like I have been forgiven for failing. I, for the first time since I lost Grace, don't feel the overwhelming sense of guilt. I'm sorry, I mumble, before leaning forward and resting my face in my hands. I'm sorry. It takes me a second to calm down, but she just sits there and softly brushes my hair while offering me reassuring words. There really is nothing in the world like a mother's touch, even when that mother isn't your own. When I can finally control the whirlwind that is swirling around inside of me, I look up and meet her eyes. She wipes her eyes with one of her towels and smiles sweetly at me. Greg, if there was ever a doubt in my mind about how big that heart of yours is, you just proved it without question. I stay with Lily for a few hours and help her finish up some things around the house. I need to be around her, someone connected to Melissa, but I also need the comfort that she offers. When I leave, she pulls me into a hug and wishes me luck. The last place I want to go was home. I want to drive around Hopetown until I find my girl and carry her home. At this point, I feel like I could keep going until I meet Ocean if it meant that I could get my girl in my arms. The need to have her in my arms is overwhelming. But I know Lily was right. She needs time. So I will be strong and give it to her. I've only been home for a few minutes when I hear the front door click open. I instantly mute the TV and stand from the 